is when everything is built upon. We can talk about whatever we want, we can talk to we're blue in the face, but if we don't understand that, none of the rest of it makes sense. We, tr we have to truly understand that we are to love God and then everything falls into place. Because the thing is, if God gets our heart, He gets everything. Yeah. It's like I wanted to, you know, it, that's what you think about it. If, if He gets the desires of our hearts, everything that we do, all of our motivations, everything that we do in our lives, if it's out of the desire to love God, We can't help but be successful. We can't help be successful in what God wants for our lives. You know, and, and here's the thing. Even if we follow that commandment, and, and what we're saying is true, we, we hit on this last week, then we have to look at what the second commandment that followed right up after that. And that is to love our neighbors as ourselves. So why did Jesus make this statement? If we could sit here and say that loving God with all of our heart, and if he has our heart, then everything else clicks into place, why did Jesus need to make sure to tag in at the end of that? Then love your, the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Because you would think, well, if he has my heart, he has my obedience, then he has all this other stuff, including how I love my neighbor. But you know, I believe there's, you see, there's something here, and I think this is one of those things, and this tripped the Jews up. And I think it trips us up at times, though, too. It kind of messed with them a little bit. I believe the Jews, they were loving God, but they weren't loving each other in the manner that they needed to. They understood the concepts of things, but it wasn't necessarily being put into practice. Because when we have to love our neighbor as ourselves, this is where we begin to look outside of ourselves. And then we have to do this in order for us to be whole. We have to look outside of ourselves. And this is one of those things, this is one of those paradox statements. And a paradox statement is one of those things that just doesn't really make any sense. Logic and reason go out the window, and it makes no sense to us. And we find those within Scripture all the time. We, say, we sit there and say, well, it is in my weakness that I find strength. You're going, well, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Why is it in my weakness that I can find strength? But for those of us that know it and have a relationship with God, we know that it's in our weakness. And then when we lean into God and that we open ourselves up to what God has for us, He gives us His strength. And we find a strength that we never would have been able to ourselves. But we have to set ourselves aside. But when you first make a statement like that, it doesn't make any sense. The logic of it at first it just doesn't make any sense. And this is one of those statements. For us to be whole, we have to look outside of ourselves. And so, in order to help myself, I have to help others. That sounds, again, the world would say that doesn't make any sense. That is a paradox. This is insane. What are you talking about? What do you mean helping others are going to help myself? That's the complete, total opposite of helping myself is helping others. complete total nonsense. But I want us to look at one of the same passages, like I said, we're going to look at one of the same passages that we talked about last week, and that is in Mark chapter 12. And I believe this is, again, this is vital in our process of building our case, building our understanding of what it means to love God. Because if you remember, if loving God means being obedient, that's how we show our love, how we reciprocate our love, is by being obedient. And Jesus said, this is the first commandment, the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. That's a commandment. He's commanding us to do something. 
So we should be doing that if we're being obedient. If we're expressing our love to God, we've got to be doing that. And so we're going to see why loving others is so important to our relationship with God. So in Mark chapter 12, and we're going to start off in verse 28. It says, one of the teachers of, the, of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The teacher of religious law replied, Well said, teacher. We have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God. And no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart. And all my understanding. And all my strength. And to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So as we look at this passage, we have to realize that first and foremost, that when this religious individual, one of the teachers of religious law, most, most scholars will tell you that he was a scribe. When he asked this question, this was not intended to try to trip Jesus up. This was not one of those things that he was trying to catch Jesus and trying to say, well, you know, what, what are you going to say? What are you not going to say? Are you going to say the wrong thing that we can prosecute you? What he was saying here was they were listening to what Jesus was preaching. They were listening. Jesus was going. And he, I mean, you can just imagine Jesus was going at it. He was giving them a sermon. He was preaching to them. He was talking to them. And they were just, they were just absorbing it. They were just taking in every little ounce of it. And then this individual was listening to me. And he, he just, he started opening up his heart. And next thing you know, he's sitting there going, I get it, but I don't get it. I understand what you're kind of talking about. He was, he was, he was a religious scholar. He knew what the law said. He knew what the different aspects were. But what he was being hearing Jesus say, he was going back and going, I'm a little confused. I've read all this stuff, I understand all these things, but it just isn't making sense to me. So he opened up his heart, he opened up his mind to what Jesus had to say. And he was asking a true question out of his own curiosity. Out of his own heart, he was, he was desperately seeking an answer before Jesus. Which, by the way, this started to scare the religious leaders, by the way. Because they were afraid that they were about to lose another one of those to, to, to Christ, to his teachings. But he asked himself this. Because he was having a problem with some authentic authenticity with the reality of situations. And I want to real quickly say, I think we run into that still within the church today. Sometimes we have a problem with being real and authentic within the church. Not every church does, but that's one of the number one things if you ask a lot of the people, out, unchurched people out in the world, and you ask them, why do you not go to church? What are some of the reasons why you're not involved? A lot of them, the word authentic is one of the first things that will pop up in their defense of why they don't come to church. Is the authenticity of either the people 
or the message that they're hearing versus what they're seeing. And, and I will tell you, in this younger generation that's out there right now, they can sense authenticity like that. They know if you're being real with them. They know whether or not you're just looking to fill your monthly membership quota or you're offering plates. Or even if you're just loving them because that's what you're being told, but you're not really loving them. And I think there's a difference there. But we have this problem. I remember years, quite a few years ago, I was teaching a men's Bible study. And I, I had this group, and it was a very diverse age group. And the whole premise of this Bible study was I wanted the older men in the church to be able to share their spiritual relationships and their, their spiritual journeys they had taken with these younger guys. To be able to help show them, hey, this, these struggles are real. This is what I experienced, and this is how I was able to walk through it. And that was the whole premise of this, is we really wanted to create this cross-generational thing. Because so many times we get this mentality that, well, we're supposed to act a certain way, or it's not okay to struggle with these certain things. Or uh, there's something wrong with me if I'm struggling with these things. And I wanted them to understand there is nothing wrong with that. That it is natural to struggle with these different things. And they, it, they can be overcome. And to look at some of these, these saints of the church and say, they were able to do it. They were able to conquer it. They went down the same path you did. And they were able to conquer it. And so I asked this question. And I, I don't remember what we were talking about, what passage of scripture we were using. All I remembered was the question that I asked. And I said, when you have a moment of crisis in your life, you have a moment where the world just seems to be crashing in around you, what is your first reaction? What do you do first when that happens? And sure enough, I had one of the gentlemen, he popped his hands up and he goes, I get on my knees and I pray. And I looked at him and I said, that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. But I said, have you always done that? Yeah. Has everybody in this room always done that? Well, yeah, that's what I've always done. I said, are you sure about that? I said, you've never once in your life gone, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? You know, the, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, what am I going to do? He got mad at me. He started to quote scripture at me. He was, I mean, he was like, that's not what scripture tells us that we're supposed to do. And I said, but you're not understanding what I'm saying. So I'm not telling them, saying, this is what we're supposed to be doing. I'm saying, we know that we're supposed to get on our knees and we're supposed to seek God. But what have you always done in your life? Have you struggled with this at any point? And every one, most of those men, all of you, and I had this younger group of men sitting there going, Psh, yeah, okay, I, I have a hard time believing this. To them, they were not getting the authenticity that they needed. They were not seeing what they needed to see. They were not hearing what they needed to hear. And it was one thing my pastor at the time, he was sitting, he was sitting in the back, and he just was chuckling this entire time. Then this whole thing. He finally chimed in at the end of it and kind of said, yes, I don't, again, he reiterated, I don't think you understand what he's asking. He's not asking, is this what you're supposed to do versus what you have done? Yeah. But it was one of those moments where we had a group of individuals that was struggling with something. And they needed a real, authentic answer. They needed a group of guys, in this particular instance, they needed a group of other men to come around them, to gather around them, to love them, and say, it's okay. It's okay to struggle with these things. I've struggled with them too. But there is an answer and there is a way out of it. And let me show you the path that I was able to take and how God was able to help me. But sometimes we, we don't want to show our weaknesses. You know, this scribe in this story, he was struggling and he wanted real answers. To put this into perspective, Jews had 613 laws and commandments to observe. 613. 
Could you imagine having to try to keep up with 613 laws and commandments that you had to observe on a day-to-day -day basis or a week-to-week -week or a month? I mean, some of these came around every so often, but you still had to remember them. Now, out of those 613 laws, 316, 365 of them were negative. They were, don't do this. 248 of them were positive. They were the, do these. These are the things you want to do. So there's a, there's a mixture of both of them. There's things that we're not supposed to do and things that we're supposed to do. You see, this eager and hungry mind, he wanted to know how to cope with such a maze of different laws. It was mind-blowing for him. Now, you've got to remember, this is, a re uh, this is a teacher of religious law. He was not just a, a bum that walked in off the street. He was educated. And he was struggling with how to make sense of this. And this was a legitimate question. I will have to say, if you sit here and you look at these commandments, I will have to say, I can, I can relate to it. I remember growing up in church. I remember growing up, and I remember it was an adult before I really heard everything summed up underneath these two commandments. As a child, as a teenager, I had never heard my spiritual life summed up in these two commandments. Love God, love others. And I remember the first time I heard that, I went, how have I missed this my whole life? How have I not gotten this? Why have I not heard this? So I, I, can, I can understand where he's coming from. I remember looking at our theology. I remember looking at our doctrine, and it was so overwhelming. And I'm going to tell you, there's still times I look at it, and it's overwhelming. I remember when I first started school, I was so anxious, I was so excited, because I could make sense of so many different things. And I was looking forward to being able to make sense of so much of the stuff that's in here. I understood some basic principles, but I'm going, there's so much to it. It's so deep. I don't even know where to begin. And I was overwhelmed. And I remember going through school, and I remember at those different points, I remember starting to take Bible classes and theology classes and doctrinal classes, and I'm going through them, and I'm going, at first I'm going, I'm not learning a thing. I didn't feel like I was learning a thing. And then one day, all of a sudden, I took one class, it was one of those moments where you kind of got to reflect back and you kind of saw the path behind you and you realized how far you had actually come from where you started at. You just felt like for a while you've just been spinning your wheels. And I struggled with that. And I also have to realize that sometimes I think pastors, pastors, especially pastors, we sometimes forget this. You know, it's cost me five years and $40,000 to go through school to earn my degree. The average person is not going to spend five years of $40,000 to go through Bible classes and learn about theology and doctrine, and, you know, how to read scripture and how to do all these things. And we forget sometimes what it's like to be sitting out there to be looking at this and be sitting there just going, this is mind-blowing. There's so much here, I don't even know where to begin. It's, and I'm struggling with this. And yet, we, then you wonder why sometimes people go, okay, I'm going to just set that over here, and I'm going to think about that another time over here. Mm -hmm. It's too much for me to try to figure out. Yeah. But when we realize, and we can take the scope of everything underneath here, and we take these two things, and we say, love God and love others, it kind of all makes sense. I found it funny. I had a pastor friend, and he's sitting in a church board meeting one time. And, yeah, well, it was after a church board meeting. And I heard a board member, and it was, this was me personally, I heard a board member, and this was not in a good light. And he made the comment, doesn't seem like no matter where our pastor starts off at in his sermons, he always ends up in the same place. 
And this was not a compliment to him. Trying, he was not trying to make this as a compliment. Because it all comes back to a couple of key things. Yeah. Loving God, loving others. That sums up the Ten Commandments right there. Yes. Loving God, loving others. Yeah. We should come back to those two main points in everything that we do. So I look back at that now and I just go, boy, this person meant it as, a, as an insult. And I look back and I just go, what a compliment to that pastor. Because we should always come back to those things. That's how important they are. And so we have to be careful. Like I said, pastors, we like sometimes we start throwing around big words. And they're confusing. I did this with my teenagers one time. And we did nothing. But I sat down and made a list up. And we sat down and said, what are words that you hear around the church that you don't understand what they are? You'd be amazed at how long that list was. And they're going, these, these are words that we don't even use in the modern day English language. And so why would they understand those things? And they're words that we don't really have a substitution for. There's not a modern day word that we could use to try to relate this concept to them in one word. But they didn't understand what it was. And so they kept hearing this stuff thrown around and it made no sense to them whatsoever. So we took the time and we walked through them one by one by one. But everything comes down to these two things, loving God and loving others. I got to the point with my teenagers, I could look at them, hold up two fingers, and say, what are the two commandments? And they knew right off the bat, they could say, love God, love others. Everything that we talked about, everything that we did, came back to that. But in this time, we've been in this passage with Jesus, Jesus, this was the first time that these, that, that these two commandments were linked together. This was the first time. This was groundbreaking for theology at this time. Remember what I said, I said this last week or the week before. And I said, you know, Christ did not come to replace the Old Testament. Christ came to give, help give a pure interpretation of the Old Testament. And so he was, they were looking at this amount of laws and this amount of information and their minds were just completely being blown apart. And they were trying to figure it out. They were trying to do the best that they could do. And so when we would sit there, and we would have to be careful, when we sit there and we look at scripture and we talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and we talk about those different individuals, and we usually have a tendency we talk to them about it in a negative light. But we have to realize that some of these people were just truly lost individuals. They were individuals that just did not know the difference. They didn't understand it. They were lost. Just like we cannot get mad at somebody out there in that world because they don't understand and know Christ. Because if something that they do contradicts the life of Christ or the life of a Christian. They don't know any better. If anything, it should just break our hearts for them. It shouldn't make us mad and angry at them because if we really love them, we're going to, our hearts are going to break for them. And maybe we're going to feel pity. We're going to, listen, we're, we're going to have compassion for them. Because they don't know the difference. And that's our job, is to help show them the difference. There are times that there's nothing more heartbreaking for a pastor than to hear people make that comment about a non-believer in a derogatory fashion. And you're just going... They don't know any better. Tell them. Show them. Don't get mad at them or run them down. You see, these two commandments, like I said, they summed up the, 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 the two big commandments. Those stone tablets that they received. Those ten commandments. Those commandments that laid in the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus summed it all up. He blew their minds that day. See, so not only do we, we, I sit here and said that if we love God with all of our heart, then if God has our heart, everything else falls into place. But I think we have to, we really have to encompass both of these. Because I think you can sometimes, we can say that we love God, but we're not really putting it into practice. 
We're just focusing on ourselves. We're going, God, give me the strength to be holy. Make me just like you. And we focus on just our internal things. But there's, there's two sides of that coin. Just like within the church, we have a little thing called discipleship. And that's all focused on us. That's focused on teaching and training, making us Christ-like. But there's another side of that coin that's called evangelism. And it's going out into the world and spreading that gospel. And it takes both of them working together. It takes us going out into the world, finding those non-believers, bringing them back into the church, discipling them, teaching them, showing them, mentoring them, and then sending them back out to the world to go find more people to bring back into the church to do the whole thing all over again. And sometimes we get stuck in one or the other. Sometimes we get stuck and all we do is evangelize and we don't disciple. Which if you do that, your numbers are going to dwindle because the people are going to start crumbling when the enemy attacks because they're not being discipled. And the other side of that is if we, all we do is disciple and we don't evangelize, we're, one, we're not really taking it at heart because part of that discipleship is learning to have the heart of God. Teaching to have people to have the heart of God. And part of having the heart of God is sharing that with others. You see, to get to the heart of true religion is seen in a positive, personal attitude to God and man. It takes both. It's both God and man. It's a relationship between them. You see, if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, then we have to and be able to love others. We have to love others, and we have to be able to love others. Yes. We will be obedient, and God is going to help us to do it. Because let's face it, some people are hard to love. Did you guys agree with me? Amen. We've all ran into those people in our lives that we would sit there and say, they're hard to love. And you know what? They may have said the same thing about us. We're not easy. Relationships are not easy. Personalities are not easy. And the more people that you start mixing into it, the harder and more complicated it's going to get. If we start to grow, we start reaching out, we start, this church starts expanding, God starts blessing us, and we start, we start bringing new people to Christ, and our members are going, guess what? It's going to get complicated. It's going to get hard. It's going to get messy. Because some of those people may be hard to love. And you know, they may think the same about us. But if we want them to be obedient to Christ, like we should be obedient to Christ, they should see that love pouring out of us. Sometimes we like to just pick the easy ones. We just love the ones that are easy for us, the ones that are just like us. Because if we just pick the easy ones, well, hey, there's no complication to it at all. But what about all that? That's not what God's telling us. He's saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you, have you got, have every one of you guys picked who your neighbor is? Do you have control over who your neighbor is? Most of us can say, no, I don't own the house next to me. That person owns it. They might come in and move in and out if it wants to. I have no control over that. And see, and at this point in time, there was also, in this passage of Scripture, it was also taught by some extremists, the zealots, that we are to love our neighbor and hate our enemy. That was what they were being taught, was to love our neighbor and hate our enemy. But Jesus was teaching that the neighbor meant everyone. Not this group of people or that group of people. And let's face it, when we look back at Jewish history, especially in the time of Jesus, the Jews were not the most loving group of people. They were judgmental. They were arrogant, condescending. Mm -hmm. We're the chosen people. We're better than they are. And not only did they have that arrogance, but they looked, they looked down. Not only did they go past looking down at somebody, there were certain people that they just downright hated. 
Why do you think we have passages in scriptures like stories like the Good Samaritan in scripture? The scripture lays out all these different stories and all these things to bring those different points back to, to things like this. And this was mind blowing. And I can guarantee you that if we truly live our lives based upon this principle, if we love our neighbors as how God intended, we will see incredible things happen. First, it gives us the motivation to get out there and tell others about the gospel. If my heart is breaking for these people, I want to save them from hell. I don't want them to go to hell. I want them to spend eternity in heaven if I really love them. Because there's not one of us that has a loved one in our families that we want to see go to hell. And so if we're to love everybody the same, we should have that same desire for everybody that we pass on the street. People should be able to see it coming out of us. They should be able to see God's love, the grace of God, oozing out of us. But the second part of this is, is where we fail at sometimes. You see, we can't fake it. This is where that authentic aspect comes in. You can say you love people and tell them about the gospel, but your heart really isn't in it. It's kind of like you're just check marking off the list. I shared the gospel with somebody today. Well, just because you tell them about the gospel doesn't mean that you love them. They're going to be able to tell whether or not you really want them with you. Whether you want them to have a relationship with God. Whether you really want to be a part of their life. They're going to be able to tell these things. We're very, we're, let's face it, we're very receptive beings. God created us this way for a reason. It allows us, one, I love it because it allows me to have a relationship with Him at a very different level. But it also makes our dynamic between each other that way. The problem is, like I said, they can tell it and it will fail because to really love, to really love others, we have to be, we have to have a heart for them. I've seen people, invite people in the church and something comes out about their life or something comes up about something and we look down on them or we don't end up being there during the times of trial and tribulation when they need us the most. We don't ever say hi to them. We don't ever reach out to them except for Sunday morning. We don't connect with them outside of Sunday morning. Is that loving somebody? Seeing them once a week and never even attempting? I mean, any of them. I mean, obviously we can't do everybody. We can't have a really close relationship with everybody. But what about just even one other? You see, one of these is dependent on the other. If you love God, you will love others. Just like if you truly love them, you will not only tell them, but you will, uh, but they will, not only will you tell them, but they will see that love. Now, I can't stand here and tell you exactly how to go out into the city, to go out to your neighborhood, to go to your neighbors, and tell you how to love them. I can't tell you exactly how to do that. That's up to you and God. It takes time and an invested interest in them. Finding out what are their needs, what are their likes, what are their dislikes, what are their desires, what are their struggles. It takes investing that time in them. And then we have to find a way that we can fill that need. It takes time and a personal investment. I heard a pastor years ago tell me he had a board member that sat there and got out of him during the middle of the board meeting and said, you haven't gone and visited my neighbor in the hospital. The pastor looked at him and said, have you? He goes, I'm going to try to go visit everybody that I could possibly go visit. But the reality is, he was one individual. One individual, but the reality was, it was that board member's neighbor. The first person that should have been at the hospital visiting him was his actual neighbor, not the pastor. 
Yes, pastors are going to try to go and visit, try to do as much as what they can. But here's a little key, and especially for that younger generation, they just look at pastors as they have to, because that's what they're getting paid to do. It's going to give in that little, little clue in there, and kind of a little secret. Is that's what a lot of younger people look at, and they just look at it and just go, well, they don't really love me. The pastor doesn't really necessarily care about me right off the bat. Obviously, once the pastor builds a relationship with them, they'll know different. But right off the bat, they don't know you from Adam. You're not, the pastor's not their neighbor. And they're just looking at it going, this person's just paid to come visit me. But my neighbor, my neighbor, the person that has been investing in getting to know me, the person that we stand out in our lawns or where at work or wherever it's at, and we have conversations and we talk about things, that person came to visit me. They didn't have to, but they did. Oh, that's so meaningful. That's going to work every time. Sometimes it works with the pastor going. Sometimes it doesn't. But it will always work if, if it's our neighbor. So if we want to love the Lord the God as we should, we have to be obedient. And Jesus commanded us to love our neighbors. And we're not to do it half-hearted, but with a passion and might that would satisfy the call to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and might. So, how are we doing at that? How are we doing at loving our neighbor? Because that also reflects on how we are loving God. It directly reflects and you know, impacts our relationship with God. How we impact and reflect the others. They're connected. We may not be hateful of people. We may not be turning them away. But do we pursue them? Do we pursue them in the same way that Christ pursued us? And is pursuing them? Jesus gives us that perfect image of relentless love. That pursuing love. Someone's life. We go, this is the key thing. Are we allowing God to use us for somebody else? We go to these altars and we pray for God to intercede on a loved one, on one of our loved one's behalf. But have you ever stopped to think that maybe we're the answer to a person that's kneeling at an altar somewhere else, at some other place, at some other time, that's praying the exact same prayer for a loved one? And maybe we're that person. Maybe we're the one that God wants to use to answer that prayer, to intercede for that person's life. Maybe that's what we're supposed to do. So maybe we, maybe you can be that answer to prayer. It's not just about God answering our prayers. But maybe being the answer to someone's prayers ourselves. But that's only through being obedient and following these two commandments. It's His will be done. So this morning, just take a moment and open up your hearts to God and search your life and ask yourself if you're loving God as commanded, but are you also loving others as He's commanded? Are you loving others as he has loved you and as you love yourself? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, I don't know where we all stand at. I don't even know where we all stand at. Lord, may we not only love you, may we love others. Because, Lord, we know these two commandments are so intricately tied together. Lord, it takes one to do the other. Because if we really love you, we're going to love the others. And we're going to be real and authentic, and we're really going to love them. And so, Lord, may you give us a heart like you have. May you give us a passion, a pursuing love, a sense of grace, Lord, that can only come from you. May we, if, Lord, because we really have your heart. It's going to ooze through us. It's 
going to come out. And so, Lord, may we just ask for that, if anything, this morning. Is set ourselves aside and just ask for more of you, less of us and more of you. So not only does this go beyond the power for us to, to, to be able to act the right way, to follow these commandments, to follow these laws, to do the right things, to stay away from the wrong things. But Lord, may it also give us the power to love as you have loved. To be able to go out into this world and show people who you are. Because Lord, we are your hands, we are your feet, we are your face to this world. And may we show them that loving, that pursuing love that you have for us. Lord, we sit here and we can thank you all day long for what you have done for us. But Lord, we know how we reciprocate that love is through obedience. And so Lord, this morning, may we be obedient and to love others as you have commanded. Lord, in your, your gracious and loving name, amen. This morning, I want to leave us which is kind of a little bit of a blessing. If you guys, would, if you guys would just stand for me, and just put up your hands as we take our worship, our praise, and prayer from this place into our daily lives. May our lives be sustained through the love of our heavenly Father. May we feel the presence of our Savior walking beside us and know the power of the Spirit in both our actions and our words. May we leave this place with a peace and a passion that only you can give, Lord. We love you. You are dismissed.